College welcome you to the third day, which is also the last day of our annual Pokhri Memorial Lecture Series. Good afternoon. And I just put here once again what I had put on the first day as the plan of my lectures. And as it turns out now with the way things have been going, I will not talk anything about the uh, discrete symmetries, but I would talk so that in the interest of the time so that I can get to the because I was told by Vikram that I should do something exciting and something new. <laughs> anyway, jokes apart. So I will actually talk only about this. <laughs> so let's remember what we talked yesterday. We looked at Maxwell's equations and one of the things we realized is that the Maxwell's equations had the relativistic invariance built into them. I tried to motivate them to and to describe them to you. So, what happened was that therefore the right equations were the ones which had the correct symmetry. Again, that is the point that we were trying to understand. And this also meant, which we didn't do, but you can now write down all the four Maxwell's equations in a very compact form, which I will write today a little later. And as I told you, that simplicity of description is something that the theoretical physicists are kind of trying to aim at. And that simplicity is something that symmetries have given us. So this is one example of it. And <clears throat> what the, the group of those relativistic transformations which we discussed yesterday is the three spatial rotations, four sp space and time translations, which we had discussed each uh, separately, and then the three low rates boost across three axes. And that is the total set of ten transformations, symmetric transformations. These are the ten, ten generators of the Poincaré group and corresponding to this there are ten conserved quantities because we did discuss according to Noether's theorem which I discussed a little bit with a few students separately that associated with every symmetry there is a conserved charge and that those conserved quantities are for example energy and momentum, angular momentum and the conservation of center of mass. So, <coughs> What we did also look at a little bit, though not in great detail, is that they, 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 they writing them in a compact form, in, not writing them in terms of the electromagnetic field, but write them in terms of the potentials. So somehow the basic degrees of freedom are potentials, and then there is a whole class of redundant potential, one set of all which are all related, which all give the same physics because they all give the same electric and magnetic field and finally the only thing that we measure as I kept on saying was the only things that we are going to be measuring in some simple way when we understood it will be B plus. Right? So if I have a whole <coughs> tower of potentials all of which correspond to the same E bar and the same B bar I am not going to be able to distinguish between them by any major <laughs> And therefore one would say that that's the symmetry of this uh, system, that's the gauge invariance. And now this is the first time I'm giving you an example of what I have called internal symmetry because it's a transformation of these gauge fields which are your variables, okay. And this is not something that is directly <coughs> observable, directly observable are these electric and and what you are doing now, you are doing transformations on a quantity which is other than the space and the time coordinates that we had been thinking of. We had said we rotate the coordinates, we translate the space, we translate the time, we reflect the time, there is space. I did not yet talk of reflecting the time, but so these are all space-time symmetries, whereas here we are now talk, beginning to talk about an internal set. And this invariance actually corresponds to con corresponding conserved charge is the electromagnetic charge. This was a question that you were asked. So before I take this whole idea further, let me go back to relativistic invariance and sort of quote again a uh, few people. Bergman basically uh, uh, says this, which is very nice, I like it that these laws of physics which they express, he's talking of relativistic invariance, which express the basic invariance of symmetry of physical phenomena, they seem to be our most fundamental ones. That's what I was talking about. 
reduction simplicity of a formula and that has that is there because of the invariance but in these cases it took the genius of faraday's and maxwells to understand and encapsulate the observed <coughs> phenomena in terms of this set of equations so it was not the symmetry principle that drove those equations it was after the equations were written people realized that these equations have inbuilt these invariance principles but understanding that these are inbuilt there that that was something that was beautiful and that's what bergman says that they made the description of the physical phenomena simpler and more compact and hence more beautiful to a physicist so actually poincare goes on to say that the scientist does not study nature because it is useful he is a mathematician anyway and then he says for him a scientist is also a he which also he should be pardoned he studies it because he takes pleasure in it and he takes pleasure in it because it is good this is my first slide that i was talking about symmetry and beauty so that symmetry and beauty was the visual beauty we were talking about here is a beauty of thought and it's an organizing principle the symmetry has given you an organizing principle for physical laws and that's perhaps one of the uh, sort of uh, you know nice things about symmetries of law and what we have now done here is i think we have taken the the laws of the symmetries of the laws of motion which are corresponding to space time transformations to its last stage right so now you know you go back and say but well, now i go to quantum mechanics because that is the right dynamics when you are starting to look at what happens in an atom for example and for at least that's what we learned that people like uh, great scientists like bohr and so on had a lot of trouble trying to understand what is happening at the center of an atom in terms of classical principles and then one had to actually devise A completely new mechanics, and that's quantum mechanics. So now we know that if the hydrogen atom, the electrons travel in the first orbit. Does anybody know offhand what is the velocity of an electron in a hydrogen atom in the first orbit? You can actually do it very trivially. Okay, very simply, you can look at the or something like that. You can calculate, and that velocity is simply d by the alpha. Alpha is one over one thirty seven. It's V by C of the orbit. Okay, so velocity if it's V, if V by C is one over one thirty seven, then it's a pretty slowly moving object. Huh? So it's non-relativistic. But now, having understood the importance of relativistic invariance, people right after the quantum mechanical wave equation was written down, started asking the question: Can I have a relative version of this equation which is relativistically invariant? Now, to begin with. Let's just note the equation, the Schrödinger equation, which was minus h cross by 2m. Oh, sorry, there should be del bar square psi r bar t, which is i h cross d psi by dt. Now you will realize that on the left hand side, the space derivative is order 2, degree 2, and the time derivative here is there or uh, degree 1. So obviously, a relativistic transformation which mixes space and time cannot leave this equation invariant. We, that is obvious, right? I mean, we did do, for example, yesterday. how newton's laws of uh, motion are explicitly invariant under the change of the coordinates rotation of the coordinates translation of the coordinates now here we can see that we don't even begin to attempt it because we see that even the order of the derivatives is not the same between space and time and x prime under uh, lorentz boost is going if it's a uh, say less, less boost is along the x direction x prime is going to be x minus e to upon square root of 1 minus e square by c square so the weight is all off this is obviously not invariant <laughs> so people actually were trying to figure out what is the uh, version of a wave function wave equation which will be relativistically invariant a uh, long story short a very long story short uh, dirac and i think it's really a tribute to his i don't know what words i should use for the man's ability But this is absolutely one of the prince of uh, you know this century is physics, and he did not only invented quantum mechanics, but he invented, and that is the whole 
I would think that this is even more significant. Namely, he got a relativistic wave equation. Now, what is this wave equation? So, first thing, both derivatives, gamma mu d mu. So, this d mu is d by uh, dx, d by dy, d by dz, and d by dt. This is a summation convention which was introduced by Einstein. So, mu goes over 0, 1, 2, 3. So, this one term stands for four terms. Ih cross gamma naught d naught, that is gamma t d gamma naught d by dt, etc. etc. So, then all the four derivatives, position there is a space derivative and time derivative order at this, occur at the same order. Okay? And x mu is a four vector which is again has three, four components. R bar is the regular position vector that we are used to. And then ct is the uh, fourth <coughs> component, or it should have been written ct r bar, I'm sorry. And gamma mu are just four constant, four by four constant matrices. We can forget about them for our purposes. They are very, very relevant for a lot of things. But right now what I am trying to show you is that <coughs> so these are just numbers. As far as we are concerned, these are derivatives with respect to x, y and ct. And this is the wave equation. And there were many, you know, this, this equation actually explains, for example, why the gyromagnetic ratio of the electron, what is the gyromagnetic ratio, I think this is something we all know from optics, in uh, understanding, not optics, sorry, atomic physics, when we are trying to understand the spectral lines, and we know that the gyromagnetic ratio, which is the ratio of the magnetic moment of the electron with uh, its spin angular momentum, is 2, whereas for the orbital angular momentum, the gyromagnetic ratio is 1. I think this is something I can take it for granted as known. Now, in atomic physics, in explaining the spectral lines, this was more or less introduced by Hand, saying that once I put it to be two, everything is good in the heaven and my spectral lines exactly agree with what I compute. But this is an intrinsic property of the electron, and this fact really tells you that this equation which Dirac derived. By simply demanding that let me have a wave equation which is relativistically invariant, predicts that the electron should have gyromagnetic ratio to and spin. That is, if that, I should change it the other way around. For a spin half particle, a relativistic invariant equation predicts that the gyromagnetic ratio G must be. So, in some sense, you are predicting. And then you are saying, oh, experimentally also I find G is equal to 2. That's very good. Because if it was not 2, I would have to worry and say, is, then how, how, you know, this description is not relativistically invariant. So this is kind of explaining an observed. Okay? But, and this is again the power of symmetry. Right? So, the other and most significant thing was, that this equation actually has very complicated solutions. This is a 4 by 4, mat four you know, this is a 4 by 4 matrix. So you can see that these are actually 4 equations. I hope you can understand that, right? So since these are 4 equations, this object that is the wave function has 4 components. And 2 of these components describe an electron. As we know, electron has 2 degrees of, you know, because it's spin half. One, the electron can exist in 2 possible states. One with a spin projection plus half and one with a spin projection minus half. So that's an easy way of understanding it. And then there are two more left. There are four components and the other two components, we, one interprets them as <coughs> two component wave function of a particle which is same mass of electron, same spin as that of the electron, but its electromagnetic charge is positive. So this is now what one is saying that if this equation is right and if electron which is a solution of this equation, one of the solutions of this equation exists in nature, the positron must exist because this equation tells me that, so if one of them is realized as reality by nature, the other one better be there, there is no reason, you cannot say that I will, nature is, has realized only part of the solution of this equation, if this equation is really describing reality. So therefore, you must be able to find the antiparticles. So this is like invariance or relativistic, uh, relativistic invariance has predicted that this particle should exist. 
an intent of this truth. At that, until that time, one didn't know. Only electrons were known. So, in fact, it was not known. The, and then people, actually experiments were done. And one found the positron. So, yesterday I gave you one example. Namely that of the neutrino. Which was a new particle. It was predicted by Pauli. Based on requiring symmetries. That were conservation laws. Here again, symmetry has predicted existence of a particle. So, in general, what it says is that each fermion has to have an antifermion, like the positron is an antiparticle of electron, antiproton is an antiparticle of uh, proton, antineutron will be an antiparticle of neutron. See, my God, neutron. It doesn't give an electromagnetic charge. So, how do you talk about antiparticle of a neutral particle? It doesn't have quarks which have the opposite charges. Yeah, so I've not even come to the quarks. I'm asking the question. Why, how, in what sense would I say a neutron is an anti-neutron is an anti-particle of neutron? It is, so it is not just the electromagnetic charge that distinguishes them from each other. That is the fermion number which distinguishes them from one another. And one can actually say, find out that the fermion number is also observed to be conserved and the symmetry associated with this fermion number, conservation law, now I can use the word Symmetries, because I told you, rotation sy symmetries we understood were described by a rotation group. Now I said, okay, I'll take any odd group of transformations. Now, this, this equation of motion, okay, this equation of motion is actually invariant under a gauge transformation like this. You change it, and this is just a exponential i alpha. Do a phase transformation, the equation will remain unchanged. Huh? The phase is a constant phase, I can take it out. So, this is a invariance, and actually, this invariance guarantees to me that the Fermion number is always constant. All right. Yes? If you are predicting a new particle which is anti, for example, electron and positron, uh, in, a, in, in this universe, can we have an equal number of them? Okay, in, uh, you have asked me a good question and I can either answer it now at the risk of not finishing my lecture or I can answer it at the end of the lecture as an open-ended discussion. At the end. I think at the end of it is better. It's a valid question and I will come to it. Yes, sir. Ma'am, we are talking about the Fermi number yeah. of neutron. But in this neutron, if you want to talk about Fermi number, we have to consider Fermi inside the neutron. No, no. It, it again depends again at what scale you are talking, okay? Neutron is a fermion. Neutron is a spin of particle. It's a bound state which is what you are actually mentioning, okay? I am not looking at energies where I am at, at which I will be sensitive for the fermions inside the neutron. Let me we'll come to that later. I suggest you write down your questions in your notebook. Can I take an interjection here? Yeah. Okay, so you, you know about things called the beta decay? So a neutron, you can think of a neutron going to a proton and an electron and an antineutron. You, okay, I've just seen an antiproton and an antielectron. A neutron would not go to an antiproton and a positron. It's the antineutron which does that. Yeah. Okay. So experimentally you do see that these two guys are different parts. No, that is true. What he was really wondering. Let's go back again. Okay. I think he wanted to compute the fermion number of the neutron in terms of the fermion number of its constituents. Okay. That's how I understood his question. Uh, we can discuss this later. <coughs> so now I'm going to change tracks and I'm going to, because I decided I will make too many mistakes if I try to resurrect all the H process and seeds. So now I'm going to start working in units where I put H cross equal to C equal to 1. Because those equations come to me naturally. Earlier I was trying painfully to make sure that I don't get a mistake and yesterday actually I did make a mistake. So this is better this way. So I have a, uh, uh, we had a Dirac equation. It's obviously an equation of motion. We are looking at symmetries of equation of motion. But now I'm looking at a U1 symmetry where the gauge transformation parameter depends on the position. So now you're thinking there is a wave function. I am going to change the phase of the wave function. But I'm going to change the phase differently. It could depend on the point in space where I'm making the gauge transformation. Which means at this point, the phase is zero, maybe. 
At other point, the phase is maybe pi by 2. So I'm varying it. It's a, any arbitrary function of position and time. So therefore, now if you do this and you look at this equation, now because this d mu will act on e to the i alpha times psi, when d mu acts on it, when d mu acts only on psi, you will get a term which exists here. But d mu acting on this alpha will give me exponential i alpha d mu alpha. And that is an additional term. So this is clearly not, this guy is clearly not the symmetry of this equation. So this equation of motion is not symmetric under this u1 phase transformation. And such a transformation where your parameter depends on the position, this is called a local motion. Now I'm jumping, you know, you have to tighten seat belts compared to last few days, because now I'm going to jump very fast. All right. Now what happens, however, that is the beauty, that if you modify this derivative d mu, that is these are four terms, d, d, d t, d1, d s, d y, d z, I change it to what I call a covariant derivative d mu, this is just a name right now, d mu plus i e a mu, where a mu is the potential. So a bar and phi, these are the four components of this potential. And then the equation of motion is invariant under this u1 gauge transformation if along with this transformation, I also change a mu to a mu minus 1 by mu, 1 by e d mu alpha s. So now what do you do? You say, okay, I go back. So the equation of motion is no longer what I had here. This d mu gets replaced by capital D mu. When I replace it by capital D mu, it is d mu plus d mu plus i e a mu. And now I, I also change a mu to a mu prime. And now I look at the equation. <coughs> And I do psi prime equal to e to the i alpha x psi a mu prime equal to goes to psi prime psi goes to psi prime and a mu goes to a mu prime. Now you do both these transformations and you will see that these two transformations together are actually a symmetry of this, this equation. Once I have replaced small d mu by capital So now what you realize is that this equation by itself was not gauge invariant, but only when I coupled, you know, I added this term to this derivative, is this equation now gauge invariant. So I needed the introduction of this potential term, depending on this potential in the equation of motion. So, what you know, this kind of why am I concentrating on a mu? Because this has to do with the fact that in classical electromagnetism, we had already you know seen this that the action at a distance was explained in terms of electromagnetic fields. So we had understood long time back that classically the interaction between two charges is because there are these lines of force and then this charge which is sitting here feels the force due to this charge even and this is understood in terms of these lines of force. This was the classical electromagnetic uh, understanding. In the common prop, in the newer modern theory language, you would actually say that the force between these two particles can either be understood like this or it can be understood this way that the one charge emits a photon which is a quantum of this uh, field <coughs> and the other guy accepts it, absorbs it. How do you describe the actual processes by which a particle is created, <coughs> traverses and gets absorbed, annihilated 
All these are mathematical things that you will have to work out how to compute this. We are not going to talk about it, but that's what the framework of quantum field theory is. Because in quantum mechanics, I'm sure those of you who have looked at quantum mechanics, you cannot create particles and annihilate particles because the probability current is conserved. So when you want to create particles or annihilate particles, you have to develop a new mathematical formalism, and that's the formalism of quantum field theory. Let's just use a word and go ahead with that. I prom I said that today it's going to be very telegraphic and we are going to jump and not change that. So you can have this equivalent descriptions of the same potential energy or the force between these two charges and they are completely equivalent. So you can either think of this in terms of the field or you can think in terms of exchange of a field quantum and the properties of this quantum that you are exchanging, what is its spin, what is its mass, that govern the nature of the force. And how do you do that? You can explicitly do these calculations and you will see that if this exchange particle had a mass, the potential will look like exponential minus m gamma r times q1 by q1 q2 by r. Now the experimentally observed potential is this, right? q1 q2 by r. What does that tell me? That tells me mass of photon must be zero. Relate the rest mass of the photon is zero. That's the and that is something we know because the energy of the photon is E, which is equal to H nu, you can figure that out, right? So if tomorrow I make an experiment and I find that the mass of the photon is non-zero, supposing, then I will have to say that this whole calculation will tell me that the range of the potential cannot be then infinite. Because if there is a factor like this, there will be an exponential drop. So the fact that the observed potential, full potential is infinite range, actually requires m photon to be zero. And I also told you, oh, I didn't tell you that. Oh my god. I didn't tell you this. Somewhere I thought I had written it down. Oh, I'm going to write down in the next slide afterward. Because I changed the orders of my slides. You, I will show you in a few minutes that gauge invariance requires that the mass of the photon should be zero. So therefore, what I am trying to show you here is that the infinite range of the Coulomb potential, zero mass of the photon, and gauge invariance are all tied to it. Okay. This is just right now I am asking you to take this on faith because I cannot prove all these things. But this is, and these three things are completely correlated. So the observed zero mass and the infinite range of the Coulomb potential are then to be understood as a result of a U1 gauge invariance of electromagnetic interactions. All these three things are equal. So this I already told you that going from classical fields to this quantum field theoretical description, this we do, it uh, is based on two joint pillars of quantum mechanics and relativistic invariance. And I already told you that we extend the quantum mechanical framework to be able to describe all the processes which will involve creation and annihilation. And name for this is usually the, 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 for the processes um, a theory which describes interaction between electron and photon. The name of this theory is quantum electrodynamics. And again, I try to tell you that this quantum theory must have a gauge invariance to be consistent with the fact that we have infinite range Coulomb potential and the observed mass of the photon is zero. And in fact, people have made experiments and put very strong limits on the mass of the photon. So it's not something of fact that I'm just spewing out of my head or anybody's head. People actually have done experiments and tested how good is the uh, statement that the mass of the photon is zero. Now, there is something else which is very important. <coughs> Let's remember this that it is only the gauge invariance of the theory that guarantees that we can make predictions using this quantum field theory. And what kind of, how accurate predictions we make? In fact, the same g equal to 2 that I told you. Dirac equation told me g was 2. In quantum field theory, this g receives corrections. Okay? And these corrections have been computed. The computation has been done to 
11th decimal place, measurement has been done to maybe 12th decimal place, give and take a number there, and experiments are made with the prediction agrees with the experiment, the measurement to the accuracy of one part in 10 places. So this tells you that this theory is really, really right. Really, really, there is a gauge invariance that is being tested because you couldn't do those calculations if you didn't have gauge invariance. So you have been able to do a calculation, the methodology has been developed. This is Tomanaga, Schwinger and Feynman gave us, taught us how to do these calculations. And doing this, so how to take care of the infinities in the theory and the fact that the measurement and prediction agrees to 10 decimal places definitely gives certain confidence that if this whole, <clears throat> this I am saying because somebody asked me at the end of the first lecture, is this symmetry only an idea in your mind? Is there some proof? So these kind of agreements between theory and experiment are the proofs if you wish. Okay? So, I once again summarize a few things about uh, 3D. That this is the theory of electrons, which is the quantum of the fermion field solid, interacting with the photon, which is the quantum of the electromagnetic field in U. And this is invariant. This theory is invariant under U1 gauge transformation. And what we have seen by looking at the invariance of this equation in quantum mechanics also, that this local U1 gauge invariance requires the existence of one gauge field okay, here, which, which couples with the fermions. And the second important thing that you must realize here is that what is the way a fermion <coughs> couples with the gauge field is also, that maybe that will come on the next slide, so let me not jump ahead of myself. Okay. So now this, uh, this uh, coupling between the fermions and the electromagnetic field is just the electromagnetic charge. That is if I have a fermion or any matter particle which has twice the charge of the electron, then the strength of the coupling with the photon will be twice that of the electron coupling. So this coupling constant decides what is the strength of the interaction, uh, of the electromagnetic interaction. So, some of you know, not all of you, but some of you know that the equations of motion, for example, in mechanics, you have seen that, they are nothing but Euler-Lagrange equations and they can be obtained from a function which we call Lagrangian, <laughs> which is the function of coordinates and momentum, okay, and time. In quantum field theory, the Lagrangian, again, we introduce a Lagrangian, and it's a function of fields, which themselves are functions of position and time. It's a more complex story, but in principle, you can do the same thing. And the Lagrangian is, uh, total Lagrangian is given by the integration of the Lagrangian density over, oh, there should be a d4x, dx dr bar dt, it's integrated over whole space and time. And then from now on, I will write only the Lagrangian density, that's what I will write in the next slides. So the Lagrangian density for the QED is actually here. And when I do a variation of this Lagrangian density, like I did yesterday by deriving Euler Lagrange equations for some of you, starting from the Lagrangian, I will get an equation of motion. So this Lagrangian, this is like there in the class we had seen yesterday that I took a Lagrangian density which was uh, mh dot square and I saw that that gave me Newton's, by variation I got Newton's law. Okay. So that's what uh, you will do. And here again you can get these, uh, these equations starting from here. And by variation you will also get, if you do this you will find that you will get this equation of motion for the fermion field and you will get this equation of motion for the electron. So it's d mu f mu nu and f mu nu is again defined as d mu a nu and is d mu a nu and for, the, for our yesterday's definition you will see that e bar is nothing but it was del bar phi minus d a bar by dt which is nothing but f naught i and f i j when both these indices take values so i and j the, what i will get is b bar. So the degrees of freedom are a bar and b bar except that I have written them in this notation which makes it very complex. So the entire thing is the equation, the four Maxwell's equations are just in this one equation. So this is the compact form of the equations in a very manifestly, so just like this that yesterday we had, 
you remember we had this. Uh, what did we have? Yeah, we had this. Mg two r by mg two squared was equal to f of r. So I said that both sides are vectors. Then this is a correct equation with the rotation integral. Here also both sides are four vectors. So this uh, appear, this equation manif makes it manifest that this this form makes it manifest that this equation is invariant under Lorentz transformations. Just like this equation form itself makes it clear that it's invariant under rotations of coordinates. Okay. All right. And here this J mu, which is psi bar gamma mu psi, gamma mu is some constant matrices I told you. This is the conserved current and the integral of the zeroth component of this current over the whole space is the conserved Northrup charge. This is all going in analogy with whatever expressions I mentioned yesterday. So this is associated with an invariance. There is a conserved current and conserved charge. So here now, therefore, conservation of electric charge is guaranteed by the gauge invariance of the electromagnetic Lagrangian. And you can look at all processes that happen in the world of particles, in the world of nuclei, and you will always find charge is conserved. So this is the proof, I mean, this is the reason why that happens, is the invariance of the interaction of the electromagnetic fields with charged particles, which is gauge Okay. So here I like a very nice summary that I've taken from Professor Mukunda's article. Because what this tells us is what I have been describing in great detail, that what does the symmetry tell me? The first time I said that the early role was what I called descriptive role of symmetry. That symmetry sort of, we had found some laws of motion and then symmetry told us that this, that this, is, this is the reason why that you get this law of motion and then you say, now we find from here that, for example, angular momentum is conserved. And symmetry explains you why that has happened. You knew the conservation laws before from other places. Now here, this is what, what, what is given is the summary of almost all the <coughs> different symmetries, space-time symmetries that we know up to here in the top. And this is, for example, the Dirac equation, which I just talked about. That is, relativistic invariance told me that this is the only form of the wave equation that will be relativistic. This is the only wave equation which has linear derivatives. Then you cannot have anything but only this equation. So that's the restrictive form, uh, so to say, of symmetry. I have discussed to some extent some of these things. For example, we have discussed the 10 conservation laws. Then we have discussed this equation. I did not, I mentioned Wigner's analysis of uh, in rotational invariance in atomic systems. What I have not discussed is these last three things. And these last three things, I have begun to discuss this electromagnetic interaction. So these are the internal symmetries. And now I want to go and give you a few statements about weak interactions. Okay? So as I said, we have changed gears, tighten your seat belts, and we are going to go fast. But this will at least give you a feeling why the particle physicists sort of, you know, are so excited about this. So, you know, over decades, I mean, since the beginning of time when almost since Thompson found that electron existed as a different object than uh, you know, charged particle. There existed a hydrogen nucleus and there existed a electron. This happened 130, 35 years ago. More than that. So since then, we have come a long way. So beginning from Mendeleev, who told us about chemical elements, or even before that, the beginning from Greeks, who told us about elements, or the Panchamahabhutas, if you want to be very Indian. <laughs> So beginning from there, chemical elements, molecules, to atoms, you know, people like Dalton, you know, there's a whole series of people. And at every time if you would have asked what are the elementary constituents, you would have got a different answer. Even in 1905, you would have asked people what are the elementary constituents, you know, people would have told us there is
is a hydrogen atom. There are electrons because Thomson has told us. There are photons because Einstein has told us. <coughs> and then that's it, electron, photons, hydrogen atoms, hydrogen nuclei. Nothing much else because all the other things were not even known, right? But as you go along, as we have gone along through 100 and uh, odd years, now we actually know that fundamental particles are quarks. Somebody already mentioned <coughs> them, so let me mention them here. So fundamental particles of which everything is made up of quarks as well as the electrons and the gauge bosons which actually carry the forces. You remember I told you in this quantum field theoretic framework, force is mediated by an exchange of a particle. So there is a force, there is a force carrier. And the wonderful thing that 20th century physics has found is that all the force carriers are also fundamental particles. I mean, it needn't have been that way, but it is that. That what we find that in the world of particle physics, there are fundamental particles and there are four fundamental forces. And all the, you know, these are the, this is the list, periodic table of fundamental particles in the universe right now, as, as far as particle physics are concerned. So there are these six electron, electrons. There is an electron, there is a neutrino associated with the electron, there is a muon. Neutrino associated with the muon, the tau electron, again a neutrino associated with this. Out of which, this is the only guy that exists in the matter that is around us. The neutrinos are produced in the sun, so they are there in our world. Then, two up quarks and one down quark makes a proton. Two down quarks and one up quark makes a neutron. So, if I wanted to describe all the world that is around us, we really need only this one generation. But as it happens, there are two more generations of quarks and electrons. And these are particles which are produced in high energy collisions, in unstable situations, and then they decay. Just like a water which is on the top of a hill will flow down, a particle which has a larger mass, if it can find a way to decay into, get into a lower energy state, it's going to decay. So all the high, heavier particles actually decay and they are most, uh, all of them are essentially made up of these fundamental objects. Then are there, there are only four types of fundamental interactions. I will not talk much about this, so I will leave it. But the electromagnetic force, which is the force which holds the electrons inside the atoms, and which is responsible for electrostatic effects, electric currents, magnetic poles. It's even irresponsible later on. I'm sure you have learned about Van der Waals forces which happens nothing only because of the electron clouds which interact with each other. But the basic interaction is electromagnetics. Okay? So again, if we are just looking at things that happen outside the nuclei, which means the physics which was known before 1911, then you could actually only talk about this and be done with it. It's only when we started learning things about nucleus and we started uh, we found uh, beta decay, alpha decays, radioactive decays, that one realized that there exists a third kind of force which causes the decay of radioactive nuclei, which changes a proton into a neutron that Debajyoti was referring to, and an antiproton into an antineutron, and never, never a proton into an antineutron. Okay? Uh, actually, it's only the neutron which decays, a proton cannot, free proton cannot decay, because the, the mass of a free proton is less than the mass of the so only a free neutron can decay. But still, that is the weak interaction. Then there is a strong force which actually binds together the quarks inside the pro uh, inside protons and neutrons together and they become a proton or a neutron. And then the protons and neutrons are bound together to make a nucleus. And this effective force which binds the protons and neutrons is actually like the Van der Waals force that we have which binds the atoms together to make a molecule. But it is a residue of the in the in, internal force between the quarks. Okay? All right. So the standard model of particle physics, we call it a model, but actually it's, it's the theory almost of the fundamental particles and their interactions. It has been built, you know, over the last, actually it should be almost 100 years, combining information from a lot of different types of experiments and a large number of innovative ideas and the driving force behind all these developments have been the same.
And now we know that all the interactions are described as local gauge field theories which are based on a gauge group SU3 cross SU3 cross U. There are certain labels here. I don't have the time or the intention to go and explain to you these labels right now. But we have talked about symmetry groups. So you understand what is meant by a symmetry group. We have talked about U1 gauge interactions. Now think of a extension of these ideas involving bigger groups. What will change? The number of generators will change. If the number of generators change, I also told you, with gauge invariance corresponding to one generator of the gauge group, I found I have to have one gauge particle because quantum of that. Similarly, depending on the number of generators of my gauge group, I would then predict particles which have spin one and which are uh, quantum of the corresponding fields. Okay. So remember I had talked about the difference between electromagnetic field and description of the interaction, electromagnetic interaction as an interaction of a charge with electromagnetic field lines and an interaction between two charges as an emission of a gauge boson. Now I can extend this idea to other interactions. That is actually the basic way in which thinking has developed in the, you know, that is the major sort of basis of particle physics, describing particles and their interactions. So for example, what I am describing here is a kind of interaction which would in principle give rise to beta. Okay. So I can think of this as uh, one quark inside the neutron which emits a W boson converts itself into another kind of quark and this W boson then decays into a pair of an electron and a neutrino. So I will have a neutron for example decaying into a proton, a neutrino, antineutrino and an electron. So you can understand now the sudden split, you know, beta decay, the sudden change how a neutron that inside a nucleus metamorphoses into a proton the nucleus changes its atomic number and out comes a pair of electron and neutrino, antineutrino. So this picture was given to us without the intermediary W boson, like Fermi first. And now over the years, since Fermi first told about it to us, us, we have now developed this picture. And this W now, just like This photon corresponded to the gauge field corresponding to U1 uh, transformations. This is an analog of that corresponding to a different gauge group, namely SU. And the couplings are going to be different. It's, that's, so each group is characterized by its couplings constants. Okay. So now I have a picture. When I say that the weak interactions are described by a gauge field theory, which is based on SU2 cross U1 gauge group, it means that I can write down a Lagrangian density just like I wrote for U1, but I would write it down in terms for the SU2 gauge fields and the fermions. I would demand that it be gauge invariant, and then I look at what are the implications of such a theory for experiments. And if the experiments agree with my prediction, then we would say yes, we have the right theory or right theoretical description of weak interaction. Does it make sense? Okay. I mean, I know I have not told you very much. So, really what one does then is that, for example, one of the things that we know, what can be the differences between, let's say, the photon and the W boson? Let's ask the question. What is the difference? Weak interactions violate parity maximally and I next discuss, discussed this in my first lecture when I told you that LR symmetry is actually violated when the beta decay electrons come out, the electrons that come out are always left handed with their spin parallel, anti parallel to the direction of motion. In a mirror if I take a reflection, it, it should not change the direction but as it happens what you find is that the electrons come now right hand. So this, the electrons do not come as right hand. And that means an experiment happens here. If the mirror symmetry was true, 
the mirror reflection should also happen. But if the electron is coming out preferentially only in one direction, which is what happens, that means that in the mirror reflection, the electrons are not going to be there in the same. Okay? So therefore, mirror reflection tells you that it's, that symmetry is violated. And that is why this boson, W boson, cannot couple to both the fermions. It will have to couple only to the left-handed fermions, which means the right-handed fermions do not feel the weak interaction. So there is a basic asymmetry. You don't understand why it is there. It's an observed fact of life, and that is embedded in your gauge field. Okay. And the other point is that these interactions happen only inside a nucleus. That means they are really short range, and the corresponding gauge bosons are there for massing. Now this is the first problem. Do you remember what I told you? Gauge invariance require zero mass to the gauge. I forgot to write that part completely in my slides. I don't know how I did that. But the mass term for a gauge field, for example, for my U1 gauge field, is something like this. Now, if I look at this gauge transformation, that is the new, yeah, I have written it. If you look at this gauge transformation, a term like this cannot remain the same because it has these additional terms. Therefore, this product term it's not gauge invariant. So if my Lagrangian density had a term containing this, which would be the mass term, like we had for the electron, then gauge invariance would be zero. <coughs> and that's why I told you that M gamma had to be zero if gauge invariance has to be zero. Now we are in a bit of a pickle because the, I, we all postulated that these W's and the Z bosons, which will be the mediators of the forces, which will be the generators of the SU2 gauge group. And then you say, but gauge invariance had to be correct, has to be valid. These guys should have had zero mass. But if these guys had to have zero mass, they couldn't have had a short range. No. We have, okay, then you can say, okay, forget about the symmetry. Who the hell told you the symmetry is true? The reason that we believe in this symmetry is because we made lots of predictions based on this thing. And all those predictions were tested and found to be correct. And what were these predictions? These were predictions on ratios of different cross sections or whatever. Now you have really a problem. You have a symmetry and yet you don't have it. Okay? So this was really the problem of electrobic symmetry. Uh, I will do this. I think I'm running short on time. But this I had already explained that these are the three SU2 L gauge bosons, these are the eight SU3 gauge bosons, and this is the one U1 gauge boson. I talked about these things in words, though I didn't show you the picture. And all these have been measured, right? The mass cells have been measured, everything has been established. I mean, whatever I've written here is something that experiments have told me to be correct. These are not hypothetical particles, these are real particles whose evidence has been seen in high energy experiments. Okay? So there are eight generators of SU3 and you have eight blue ones, for example. So this is a drawing from David Gross. He says, he try, kind of tries to show what is meant by gauge, meant by gauge symmetry of strong interactions. So these blue ones which are mediating, this is a, this is a basically uh, he has taken a proton and uh, uh, I think it's UBD, so this is neutron. This is UUD, this is proton, and how, excuse me, how these uh, scatter against each other through gluon, uh, proton and neutron, how they interact by the gluon exchanges. And the gauge transformation simply changes the colors. I'm not sure you can see the color differences very well in the slide, unfortunately. Because this is, for example, this is, uh, I think it's too difficult to recognize the colors, so I can see them. So let's leave this up. So let me go to this problem of electrobic interactions. As I said, they are short range and the corresponding gauge bosons are massive. But if they are massive, the force laws over. Force laws, this is wrong. The force law cannot be 1 by r. I wanted to say that the force law cannot be 1 by r. Okay. But if they are massive, I cannot, I will have this e to the minus mu r form. And if I have e to the minus, if I have mass, mass then my Lagrangian is not Okay, this is what I explained. So I know that gauge bosons are massive. 
because the observed range is smooth. I know symmetry exists because the experimental results confirm it. So now there was this big question and that is not the only problem. The problem is also yet another one <coughs> that if the, the masses of these objects are non-zero, I am not able to do the calculations of accurate calculations. There comes infinity. They told you that the infinities are handled, can be handled only if there is gauge invariance. Now you ask yourself a question, what the heck is happening here? I do some approximate calculation, answers seem to agree with my predictions. If I try to do a more accurate calculation, if the theory doesn't have gauge invariance, I cannot do them because there are all kinds of infinities. And you in experiments, you have actually found the W's and the C bosons with the properties that you predicted in the symmetry. That is really the issue that one had to handle. And this is where the famous Higgs mechanism came into play. So Higgs actually, he did not do it for weak interactions, let me tell you. Higgs was just asking an arbitrary question. That if can a gauge boson associated with a gauge symmetry ever get a mass? So he just wanted to know this question because everybody had understood that this means that it requires zero mass for gauge invariance. So can I somehow create a mass for a gauge boson in a manner which does not destroy this medium? And this is what he, I will try to explain in the next two slides in my in works. But here this is the standard thing that you will get if you go and look on the Wikipedia, so I thought I would do this. So, here what one says, and this is really true, is that the theory on the whole, that the Lagrangian that you write, has the symmetry, but the ground state of the theory doesn't have that symmetry. Now, this is not very surprising. In a ferromagnet, you know that you have, it's ferromagnetic because all the spins are aligned, which means that the ground state, when you say, if I look at the ground state, all the spins are aligned in one direction without any magnetic field, what will you say? Symmetry is broken, correct? But the, there is no symmetry broken in the solid per se, right? Or in the metal. So what is happening? It's happening. It's only this ground state is asymmetric. It looks, it, it is asymmetric. That is true. But that doesn't mean that the interactions <coughs> do not satisfy this. This is a compli compli complicated concept, but uh, this is really the basic idea. And therefore, the gauge symmetry of fermions interacting, which uh, now here there is something interesting that happens. I told you that the gauge symmetry of this equation required that I should have a gauge boson which couples with it. Similarly, having this kind of situation where the vacuum will not have gauge symmetry, I will come to this picture in half a second, requires the existence of a spin zero particle, which we call it. So here I talk to you, by requiring the gauge, I found that this equation was gauge invariant only if there existed a gauge particle which coupled with this formula. Okay, that was required. Similarly, here what is being told is that in principle, you know, the ground state which should, in principle, if phi, this expectation value of the Higgs field, if it was zero, that's actually not the ground state because that's at the top of a heap. So that means that in principle, in the ground state, the Higgs, the, the particle will like come down on the potential heap and settle somewhere in the valley. But once it settles, the symmetry is gone. So therefore, the ground state has lost the symmetry. Okay, this is, as I said, this is a description you will find everywhere and that's why I'm giving it. I'm not very fond of it, in fact, because I want to give you a different description in a few minutes. So, Higgs, Euler, Brown, Kibble, and Haven actually solved this problem that I was telling you about that electronic theory had. And they wanted really to have the cake and eat it. So, they wanted to show us how gauge bosons are made massive without breaking the symmetry. And I already told you that this mechanism then predicted the existence of a spin zero particle. So, it is the interaction with this spin zero particle that makes the mass term for the Higgs boson possible keeping the symmetry intact. And the mechanism that I showed you in this picture was actually 
uh, invented by Namu, who got a Nobel Prize in 2008. Okay, for, just for having thought about this mechanism. Spontaneously okay. making mechanisms. But how can you do this? In the specific context of a gauge theory, Higgs did it. Okay. So these are two separate theoretical constructions. Alright. And Weinberg and Salam then independently showed that this can be used to have a theory with gauge symmetry where photons are massless and the weak gauge bosons are massive. Because this is what the experiments have told me. Experiments have told me photons are massless, I have a 1 by r potential, wz bosons are massive, at the same time they have a SU2 symmetry. All this is known to me by experiments and these people showed us how they can use the heat mechanism to construct a theory where this is satisfied so that now you can understand, so quote unquote, why this is so, because symmetry is broken spontaneous. So they really wanted have to explain how we can have masses for gauge bosons which are consistent with the gauge symmetry and the root was through the interactions with this principle bosons. Exactly like this, okay? That's why I'm bringing this again. All right. <coughs> and actually there was an additional windfall here. The same process which gave non-zero masses for the weak gauge bosons actually made it possible for all the matter particles in the periodic table, that is all the fermions, to have non-zero masses. And I should, why should I jump up and down about it? That I should try to explain. To the fact is that think about the story that I told you about parity violation. I told you that in beta decay, all the electrons that were produced were left-handed. Okay. Now, if electron has a finite mass, which it has, it has because we are measuring, but if the electron has a finite mass, and you know, I have produced an electron which is left-handed in one frame of reference, that means its direction of momentum is, let's say, parallel to its anti-parallel to its direction of motion. I have an electron. But if it's massive, I can keep on doing Lorentz transformations. I can go to a frame where the electron is at rest. Then I can go to another frame where the electron starts moving backwards. And therefore in one frame the electron had its spin parallel to the direction of motion. In another frame it will have its spin anti-parallel to the direction of motion. Then you will say that in one frame of reference the electron had weak interactions. In another frame of reference the electron has no weak interactions. This would be clearly a relativistically non-invariant statement. If the electron has zero mass, there is no problem. Because I can never go to a rest frame. Then I can be happily, you know, I can have only left-handed electrons interacting and there will be no problem in the world with relativity. So therefore the fact that I had electrons which had masses and at the same time only the left-handed electrons had a weak interaction was actually somehow in conflict with relativity. But the Higgs, so therefore, that was also not consistent with relativity, but somehow the Higgs actually solved that problem also. And it makes the electrons massive without giving this conflict, resolving this conflict. So it again the Higgs boson interactions which allow that to happen. The spontaneous symmetry mechanism also allows me to that happen. So you actually give masses to all the particles. And what you mean by give, give masses to all the particles is that you make a mechanism which makes their masses consistent with relativity and with all the other symmetries of weak interaction group S2 to n plus That's really what it means. Ask the question, what would have gone wrong if the theory does not have, did not have these symmetries? And I've already told you what would have gone wrong. I wouldn't have been able to do any calculations, accurate calculations because they would have been used. Alright? So indeed, you know, and that these calculations do make sense was actually told to us in experiments which were performed at the Large Electron Positron Collider in the 90s and at the Tevatron Collider in Formula near Chicago in USA. So these calculations, these experiments actually showed that the calculation I make assuming there is a Higgs boson in the theory and therefore I have the symmetry and therefore I can do the calculations. And when people had made these calculations and these two experiments actually confirmed the results of that calculation. So at this point you knew that Higgs boson must exist, the theory must have the symmetry. 
So therefore the last leg was to actually construct a collider and look for the position. Again this goes back to somebody who asked me, is this symmetry only in your head? People would ask the question, is this symmetry only in our heads? You know, because this is still an indirect confirmation. So that is why the large electron and large hadron collider was constructed. And in 2012, people found it. So I like this cartoon, which says we have discovered what nothingness is made up of. Because this Higgs boson is supposed to be sort of present everywhere, all pervading and interactions of the massless fields with the Higgs bosons create the mass. So that's why this is a kind of cartoon which is quite nice. This is what has happened. So therefore, I like to end with this very nice picture, which David Gross it put in his Physics Today article, summarizing what symmetries really mean for physics. One is that laws of nature, you know, give me how from a given initial condition make it possible to predict physical phenomena. What we did, of course, is that we started from the physical phenomena, we identified a few initial conditions, and we got the laws of nature. After those laws were obtained, like we discussed yesterday, one realized that these laws were, the laws had certain symmetries. And these symmetry principles actually told me what the laws of nature should have been. And then we were happy to see that this laws of motion mean that this is the symmetry of nature. But then this thing went further, right? It went further because one then one said, like Dirac did, let me see what is the equation of motion for an electron that is relativistically invariant. So that was not extracted from some observed phenomena. It was just predicted based on a symmetry principle. So that symmetry principle gave me, for example, Dirac equation, which is a law of nature. And then you figured it out that yes, everything that we have measured about the electron actually is completely consistent and this equation predicts even more. That is predicted this antiparticle. A general theory of relativity is another example I told you of the same type. So this is the world of fundamental laws of nature and the role that the symmetries are playing there. And I hope that you have got at least the essence of the idea, though not the details. So what? We are going to go further. So in fact, actually, the only symmetry that at least I know and about which many of me and my many of my colleagues have worked for many, many years, is to extend these symmetries of the standard model further. And one way it can be done is so-called so supersymmetry. Okay, I'm not at all going to discuss this because large hadron collider had looked for, has looked for evidences and we have not yet found. Let me put it this way. That is, the idea is wonderful. There is no experimental evidence. So we don't know if this idea is being realized in nature by, uh, used by nature. We don't know that. But this is one of the levels in which one can go further. <coughs> so I mentioned this yesterday that the effect of last hundred years, I would say, has been that all the laws of nature, fundamental particles and the forces among them can be encapsulated in this Lagrangian density, which is at the back of a t-shirt that is available in Sony. <laughs> sure. But I mean, I think this is a, a little bit of a joke. But the beautiful part is that this is encapsulating all that we know about electromagnetic strong and weak interaction. This equation is capable of explaining all the observed phenomena, okay? And this is the sector which corresponded to Higgs boson, which was confirmed in the LHC. So now what is left for particle physicists to do? We have two particles, very heavy particles, one top quark and one Higgs boson. And now the idea is, can you try to study whether there is any physics beyond standard model by looking at the properties of these two particles. <coughs> and there is another theory frontier on which many, many people work. Is you know This is a t-shirt you can buy in the International Center for Theoretical Physics. <laughs> Is the essay. And now you will notice that compared to this guy here, there is one more term that is general relativity. The part of the Lagrangian which includes gravity. 
this was strictly without that. Okay? So that is a theory, theory frontier which some people are working, we don't know. But that's what it is. So the road goes on. Thank you very much. she had for addressing audience at various levels, people who are more learned and less learned and everybody and we really appreciate and thank her time, her patience and the way she was always laughing all the time and that's a great achievement and I promise some of you that I'll tell you an anecdote about Dr. Popley as we remember him once again. And uh, the students remember me as a storyteller. So one of the, one of the, you know, Dr. Popley and I used to share this room next to the physics lab, and we had a lot of good time together. He was the first person to call me home. So one day I called his, reached his home, and he was very worried. So I asked him, "What happened, Dr. Popley?" And he said, "It's bad." And so I asked him what he had done, what had happened when his wife came and said, you won't believe what he has done. So I said, what did you do? And he took out this sweater from his bag and he says, it's horrible. I said, what's horrible? He says, I brought this sweater home. I don't know where I got it from. And my wife says, what have you done? You have ha added stealing to your qualities. <laughs> And then he said, I don't know what to do. And he is a very simple man. He used to go, go, and go home and come to college by bus. And he says, I'm wondering if I've stolen it from somebody in the bus. I just don't know how. My wife tells me I've never owned a sweater like this. And he says, I thought of taking it again. But I am scared somebody will suddenly catch me. Here, here, I've caught the thief, the bus thief. And he says, I don't know what to do. And he says, I feel, my wife told me last night that the person who had this sweater would be shivering in the night and cursing you. And now all his curses are, you know. So of course, I belong to one of our teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in front of you. I'm <laughs> sure <laughs> that the person who had a sweater had accidentally gone with his bag, was not, had not even realized that the sweater was missing and he was not feeling cold. And so we had a merry laugh about that. And, but what I really felt nice about him was the concern he had for getting somebody's sweater. An average person would have just thrown it aside and not worried so much about what do I do. And you know, the concern and care he had for others, he was always there to reach out. 
He was the first person who called me home. He felt I should be a pure vegetarian and used to bring cucumber and carrot and oil for lunch for me. <laughs> and during his uh, during his time with me, I slowly, you know, I should say truthfully, reduced my non-veg. Though I was planning, I should. And he was a very disciplined man, non-alcoholic, no smoking. He used to encourage discipline in everybody. He used to encourage discipline in students and teachers a lot. Uh, and he was always there for our meetings. And whenever I remember he spoke, he rarely spoke, but whenever he spoke, everybody listened because you could be sure it was something important. So now I hand over to Harish and uh, thank him also for arranging all the program. Okay, uh, so uh, we uh, already exceeded time, I so I'll cut down my part uh, uh, slightly. slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the thing is that uh, uh, one day actually I got to know that I become the Physics Society advisor. <laughs> it happens actually in the last 10 years I see that one day actually there's a sheet on the notice board that you become these advisors uh, of the Physics Society. And uh, the very thing actually that passed my thought is this moment of me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this moment in the sense that uh, it's a Popely Memorial Lecture Series basically. And, uh, I came to the department and then sort of like, you know, taking charge from my, <laughs> my earlier colleague, Sangeeta, that now I become the society advisor, what should I do? And then the first thing came is hopefully memorial lecture series. Okay, then uh, I told so how uh, and you know, what you have planned actually, you know. And she told me actually that uh, we have uh, uh, we, have, we have a recommendation, we have a proposal basically from our earlier alumni, Sobhrat Raju, that uh, uh, Professor Rohini Gorbole uh, would be the best choice uh, for this uh, year lecture series. And uh, she has already sent the invitation to her. And uh, it's an invitation and actually, uh, we're actually asking her that she'll accept our invitation. And the invitation that we always send actually has uh, more things actually, which is a, a request and sort of like our limitations. Uh, uh, that's our constraint. And uh, it is not necessary to be accepted, but uh, all these years actually, you know, all our distinguished speakers actually accepted those, those requests. And, uh, but we planned this event for earlier semester, uh, somewhere in August and September. But it didn't work out because man was not in India and she has other things to complete before that one. And then finally things actually start working and uh, we have this day, 25, 26, 7, uh, fixed for this lecture series. And the day came and uh, today actually we have the last lecture and this is the end of the lecture series. And uh, we are very thankful then for accepting uh, our invitation and accepting our other request as well uh, and making this uh, series actually to this conclusion and uh, this is 24th in series and this is a wonderful idea that we never break this series it's in fact this way. Not only that, I am the only person actually who is concerned about you know the Popley Memory Lecture Series. When I met my council members the very first day to have an introduction something like that one the members also have the same question. What about the Pope Memorial Lecture Series? So what is the plan about? So in a way, if you see you know, all those things, you see that how things are connected. Even there are actually people here, uh, Dr. Pukan, uh, I think Dr. Cherian, who actually uh, basically have an interaction, have the overlap uh, in that region. But there are many of us in the department, I think eight, nine of us in the department, we never, have never seen Dr. Popley. We never interacted with them in, in any way. But still this, this sort of you know, respect, this association and this thing actually still keep on you know, going on, not from the faculty members who have started all those things, but till the end, actually, till today, the members actually who are basically, are actually you know, the junior members basically. And they are equally concerned about this thing, 
the respect to that person, the respect to their personality. Okay. So uh, I will again thank uh, Professor to you for actually giving us <coughs> time and all sorts of things uh, the, to, to make this uh, this lecture series uh, wonderful and uh, memorable and interesting. And uh, okay, uh, let's just brief about simple thing about this lecture series. Uh, what I see is that uh, nature wants simplicity in some sense. You know. I, I being a part of one of my refresher course where 95 percent people are get, rather the, the speakers are chemistry, biology, and five from physics only. And that two from physics, they are from high energy physics, astronomy, and no one from material science, to which actually I belong. So I think 21 days I actually heard the lectures, which I actually have no idea about. Only first second slide make a sense to me. After that, everything goes off. And. Uh, then we have a constraint that you have to, to have to listen to every one of them because you have to finally write an exam based on those ones also. <laughs> so you, you can think about it. This is how the depression course goes on. And particularly if it is interdisciplinary. And not only that, on, on the last two days of the depression, you have to give like, you have to present your work also. So again, in a group of 50 person, there are almost three, four physicists and all other are chemistry and biology. So you again have to listen to around 50 lectures to which actually you have no idea. But somehow then actually I think about that, what should I talk in my presentation? So the, the, thing, the, 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 the thing actually that I'm thinking, maybe probably the same people actually thinking about our physics. Then I think that I should make out something that can make sense to everyone. And I choose my topic as signatures. Signature is a C as signatures, but signatures has a more, you know, an actual meaning and basically nature actually, you know, gave signature to everything. At different levels, nature gave us this identity through which you can distinguish yourself. Okay, I am Harish, they may come as another person exactly look like me. You may not actually, you know, be through, my, through the physical things that you can't make out there too. But nature then say that, okay, now there, there should be some mold, there should be some, some word, something that, that, that can make you distinguish. Okay, okay. If, if, if suppose that person actually knows those things, actually they have the artificial things out of, then nature gave me fingerprints, nature gave me iris scan, all sort of things. Then I suppose all those things actually failed, then nature say that I gave you DNA. Okay. So at every level, actually, you. The, the, the nature gave you some, some distinctness which can actually differentiate. And so it says that don't get confused. I gave you enough thing. The only thing is that you need to find out tools to, to find the two together, okay, and separately. And if DNA fails, then uh, the nature probably may say that, okay, I don't care now. Okay, so whether you are high or nothing else, I don't know. So in similar way, this entire process I think goes like that way. Nature gave you symmetry. And then you have to work out how you make physics, the science, the nature understanding through symmetry work. You so man actually beautifully actually take out everything, starting from the from the from the uh, Newton's law. Then actually she goes very slowly to the gauge in where is potential, etc. So she pro provides you a bigger picture, and in that bigger bigger picture, she actually take you down, 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 and he, she actually makes a thread connected. And then you can have a better <coughs> understanding. So at the end, nature's also like simplicity in that sense. Okay. So uh, again, uh, this a thank, thank you to ma'am. But uh, uh, before actually concluding this thing, actually, I want to thank every every of my colleague here who actually have who actually helped me out actually when I actually you know for travel actually in arranging all of things. So I'm thankful to everyone. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, okay, uh, it would be a catastrophe actually. I want to introduce you the actual person behind this entire scene. Team, uh, my team. Uh, if uh, I, I will be glad if actually everyone will be here. Where, where, where are my team? <laughs> <laughs> Please come up. So, what are you doing? These are the real ones of this event. Uh, I have here uh, the president of the Physics Society, Vatsala. I have vice president here, Sora. Trezra, very important person. <laughs> and then I have secretary here, Rajat. 
And there are other members uh, from uh, Astronomy Club, as is the head of the Astronomy Club, and Anubhav, and uh, with the other person? Shivam is the Anubhav and Shivam is the, is the, the head of uh, Payment Club. Mac and uh, Rohan basically take care of the journals. Rudra is our technical, you know. And Rudra uh, uh, the library. And uh, Dhruv uh, and Neil. Sir. Neil is here. And Vinayak. <laughs> So they are the second, member, second year council members, but there are more. There are more that you can see outside, I can, I can see, which, which is also make this picture bigger. Okay. So, uh, so these are the members. I think if they need the real applause, if they make this thing, you know, happen. That this, uh, this, this picture is still incomplete if I don't thank the audiences also. You are a beautiful audience, okay? Uh, I have a small request for you. With this, these lines, I am closing this uh, 24th Public Memory Lecture Series. I thank you.